So today we want to talk about a topic that uh, is more of a definition of terms, so to speak, on various forums and people discussing it. We've kind of covered like there's a kind of a vocabulary to sound, so to speak, out there that, you know, old people that have been in this a long time, not old people, but people that have been in this a long time know well and new people don't get it till they read enough reviews and so on uh, to get the verbiage. And one of the things is brightness versus clarity versus detail. And uh, all those words kind of, to, 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 when you're newer at this, they all kind of mean, well, you're not sure what they mean. Mm. You know, you're not sure. Because brightness, like, you can relate to, like, you know, light shining off this chrome vase here, right? Mm. It's, it can be bright. Um, now, sonically speaking, brightness could be offensive, too, or offending. And um, so there's levels to brightness, though. It's not just bright and not bright. <laughs> It's not it's complicated. binary. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're kind of sort of used interchangeably in some contexts, but they're supposed to mean different things. And even then, I think they're misused oftentimes. Yeah. A big challenge is a lot of times people call a headphone that is a little bright detailed. And maybe that's accurate, but it can be misleading, especially to someone that's new. Well, because a lot of people look for detail in their speakers and headphones, but like everything, there's a limit to where you want to take that, right? Yeah. There's detailed, and then there's bright. <laughs> well, and, and it's all subjective anyways. I mean, right. one person's bright is another person's dull. Maybe not that extreme, but, you know. It can be pretty considerable, like so yeah. it is something to watch out for. You need to understand the context. You need to understand the experience of the person reviewing it. Well, yeah. And well, so we, if they are an experienced person, maybe it has some merit. Well, well we see people, um, you know, Describing systems, not necessarily anything that we sell, but you watch some of the guys that have, you know, all these, there's all kinds of systems, right? And you could, you, they, they list like their headphone and their electronics and so on. And you're like, and to us, we're thinking, oh, that's going to be kind of dull sounding or that's going to be kind of bright sounding. But that's coming at it from our subjective opinion of what we're accustomed to. And that's kind of the way it goes at, uh, in this industry in general. You know, if, if you're in it long enough and you've tried all this stuff, then at some point you wind up in the middle somewhere, an average, so to speak. Or, or, or should I say, you'll take it to an extreme level, but no further, mm. right? Well, at least for you. Well, for you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that does tend to, tend to meet up, though, doesn't it? I mean, mm. yeah, I think to some general, extent. Experienced yeah. people tend to wind up at a similar point in, in, in this game. Usually, but everybody does seem to have a bit of what you would call a house sound. They have a small shift in what other people might consider absolute neutral, and that's really difficult because, of course, everyone has different ears, different preferences, different musical tastes, and different tracks and albums are mastered differently. So it could be what's neutral for one person is bright to another. That's the real issue. Yeah, it's tough to say uh, what you like versus what I like. You know, we kind of covered that where all our ears are different and all that, so on and so forth. But um, but in the end, I think people as humans in general tend, and even animals, a lot of animals, tend to react to certain sounds in a negative fashion, particularly if they're overdone, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like if a horn blew in a house, right, your mm -hmm. cat or dog would probably shit themselves, mm -hmm. right? And you probably would too, but, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> you know, because <laughs> yeah. you don't normally hear that sound in a home, right? Like what the hell is a horn going off in here for? You know, sirens are like that. There's certain sounds, you know, but there's certain sounds that you now you're not accustomed to hearing. You're a little more sensitive to. And I think music's like that too, where you're listening to music and now you're you know there's certain instruments that, for whatever reason, the system's playing it on the brighter side of neutral, right? So now it's annoying you. It's like it's not the way you normally hear the instrument. So and and that that comes with experience, I guess, knowing what to expect and or or should I say what you've heard in the past and, you know, live instruments. Of course, a lot of people will claim to be, the, obviously, the de facto standard. Have you ever stood in front yeah, of a physically piano Physically standing yeah. in front of the instrument. Yeah, or cymbals being played, or right. a piano, or uh, whatever, you name it. You know, someone hitting a, a note on a, on a guitar, you know, even with like a 100-watt tube amp on it. <laughs> you know, and, and even that makes a difference, right? Even from the play side, right? You play on this 100-watt Marshall with the Marshall stack ball. It sounds completely different in your smaller box well, yeah. with, with, with 20 or 50 watts. Mm -hmm. doesn't even compare. In fact, when you get somebody who's never had a big stack like this and they plug in, they're like, a big smile forms on mm -hmm. their face going, man, I should have got something like this a while ago. And that's kind of the way it is on a playback chain, if you ask me. 
you know, it's the same thing. To some extent. It's not, you haven't never experienced it before. Therefore, you don't really know what to expect. Well, that's true. Yeah, I guess if you never heard anything that you, you're just like annoyed with, you wouldn't know that that's your like limit. Yeah, you right. Know, you don't you don't really know what it is until you're like, Ugh. it's kind of <laughs> like like a smoke detector going off. Like it's designed to be annoying, right? Yeah. It's just Ugh, yeah, loud it's and piercing. It's made to wake your ass up. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a different use That's case. different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine listening to that all day? Uh, yeah. What do you do for a living? Yeah, I, I, I QC smoke detectors for a uh, living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, it's like an island. Calibrate the tone <laughs> of the smoke detector to be yeah. as annoying and piercing as possible. Yeah. yeah. There was an old show uh, like that with... Uh, uh, back in the day, I grew up with the Three Stooges, and yeah, I was say, you know, Stooges. black and white. Where they, one, they worked in a horn factory, the three of them, okay. <laughs> and one of them had a nervous breakdown because all day long their job was to squeeze the bulb on a horn, like on a bicycle, and okay. make sure it worked. <laughs> that was their job in an assembly line. And one of them had a Mo had a nervous breakdown. He's like, "Horns to the left of me, horns to the right of me, horns," and he cracked. He just couldn't. They had to take him on a vacation, which mm-hmm. turned out to be not much of a vacation after all. Classic. Well. Another factor to take into consideration is it could be that a headphone is not actually more detailed. It's just appearing more detailed because it seems that most people more or less have a finite amount of perception. You could only really sense so much at a time with your hearing similar to your vision to some extent. Uh, It just becomes harder to focus on a hundred different things at the same time. So, For the most part, things that are a little bit brighter oftentimes can be considered to be more detailed because usually there's more information physically in higher frequencies. So it kind of puts an emphasis on those higher frequencies, which makes it a little easier for you to notice them. Doesn't necessarily mean the gear actually is more detailed, and that's a troubled distinction. It could just be that it's more bright than another headphone, which makes it easier for you to notice. But to some extent, you could argue that it is more detailed because you notice it here and you don't there, but it's not actually necessarily a difference in the resolving capability. Well, of course, with EQ and stuff like that, you can make things brighter sounding, which gives the perception of greater detail. But the reality of it is what you're doing is you're shifting the tonal balance of the playback, right? You're, if you accentuate the high frequencies, but not the low frequencies, yeah, which is yep. a volume control accentuates all frequencies simultaneously. So mm. picture per turning up the volume. Now, versus that versus picking a small region of frequencies like the upper freaks, like with tone control, EQ, tone control, bringing that up. Now you're changing the tonal spectrum of the, of the playback. And so at some point you'll picture that turning that up to a point where it gets annoying, right? That's bright. That's too bright, right? So that's brightness. And um, so somewhere you've got to strike a, a tonal balance for the recording you're listening to the, to the album or the song you're playing. Well, I guess you can come at it from the other angle and reduce the bass <laughs> until it's like perceive the highs are. Yeah. In fact, that's one way to, to add yeah. detail, too. If you drop the bass out, then it would, like a headphone that can't do bass well, right, will sound will sound more detailed because it doesn't have the spectral balance and the lows to to balance out the high. So yes, you get more detail. Yes, you get more, inf- you can perceive more information, but the reality of it is the spectrum is tilted upward. It's pretty much like in a movie, racking focus from one subject to another, draws your attention away from one to another. It's kind of the same thing, right? It, you could adjust where most people preferentially pay attention. Um, so if you have a ton of bass, a lot of times it's harder for people to see detail. Um, they don't notice it quite as much because there's more going on. Well, the bass overwhelms the, the mids and highs. Yep. Yeah, it just takes over. And even with a lot of speakers, that's an issue because, it, um, you know, d- depending on the speaker, the design bass tends to affect mid-range a lot, which would be the vocal range and stuff like that. It it masks the detail because the driver's so busy producing 50, 30 to 50 hertz, right, that it's just overwhelming the upper the upper range of the freaks. Um, that's why you separate the bass drivers, you know. In a speaker. Yeah, usually. Yeah, in a loudspeaker <laughs> with multiple drivers. But in a single driver's uh, headphone design, it's not so easy to, to do. If to, you know, and it, I, I know some reviewers actually do that. They'll test they'll test a headphone for that. They'll play something, music with, that they know has a lot of bass content and see how it mucks up the, the vocals in the same song, yeah. same track, you know. And some, some uh, headphones are, are better at doing that, at not doing that than others. 
in terms of playing clearly through the whole entire frequency spectrum. But, you know, and that, that's our word. Like, I, I, I like telling people that we have clarity to the source. And see, that's a whole different way to look at it. You know, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm, I mean, in some respects, you're pretending to know what the recording sounded like when it was made. Okay, I don't. I wasn't mm -hmm. there. None of us were, right? <laughs> Unless the guy was there, unless the guy recorded is in the room with you. I've seen that before. We have like, had that. I was here when this was recorded. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see if it sounds like that yeah. here. And uh, but it's just been too many pro been through too many mastering processes since they played it down. Know where it went wrong, right? But uh, but yeah, I mean, so but, but bottom line is that if you do this long enough, and I mean, really with critical listening, at our level, you can reach a point where you can get a a good average of what particularly some tracks do should sound like you know at least what you think they intended to it because you could take it to an extreme in all the various frequency ranges the, the lows the mids the highs through all different systems yep from your car to your speakers to your headphones you've heard it on everything yeah and so you know you know you, and so you're you're assuming you have to assume that the recording is as perfect as could be in the eyes of the mastering and the mixing and all that, right? So assuming that, you're also assuming then that um, that anything you could draw out of it in terms of listening to every instrument vocals is also, if you can get it better without making it sound worse, that's probably where the original recording lies. That's, that's the sonic character of the original recording. And again, this comes with decades of experience in listening to the recording a thousand different ways through different materials, you know, and, and starting to understand the recording. We got guys in the two-channel industry in particular that play albums from the 60s and 70s that they've listened to literally their whole life. Literally. Right. 50 years they've been listening to this album. They know how it sounds like on everything. And at some point, you actually start to figure out what the album really sounds like at some point. You know? Yeah, a guy came to our room one time with an album. He's like, I always listen to the same album. I was like, well, we don't have a turntable. <laughs> so he's probably been listening to it for 50 years. Yeah, right. And now with the digital formats, of course, that changes the whole game because now everything's been redone, remastered. So you're, you're nowhere even near the original recording. So it, I, I found a lot of times it does help if you can find the original pressing, the original recording, you know, whatever it is, that go back to the beginning. You know, like I got albums from ACD and stuff that were made. ACDC and uh, the rock. I grew up in the classic rock era, right, for listening to music. I got albums that I still have at home that I bought then. Mm -hmm. Those are the originals. That, that it, That's when the song came out, right? It doesn't get any better than that, really, in terms of how this song's been remixed and mastered over the years. And that's kind of a good reference point, you know, because so, remasters, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good. Depends on what they're trying to do. Yeah. If they're trying to make it popular again, it goes on the radio. Well, that's true. A lot of times they really skew it. Yeah, they muck it up for a different, whole yeah. different system. Yeah, it's not made for high-end audio type thing. But, but on, on on that note, I mean, it's a good thing to see that you know we're getting more lossless music. Apple's gone in the, in, the, in the fray now. We've getting we're getting clearer to the source, and that's clarity where, you know, you're getting rid of the mistakes in between. The, the whole process that goes from the recording to your ears, eliminating those faults in between is really helpful to get greater clarity to the source. Well, I think of it kind of like if you watch like a VHS as a kid of a movie and then now you see it in Blu-ray or whatever and it's like, well, it always actually looked like that, but the format to get to you, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. is what's changed. Like it's yeah. always looked good. Right. But... You know, you've never seen I've it. noticed quite a few things where I saw the movie more recently and it's totally different from what I remember. And I think there's a, a fairly good example, The Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah. Like the, <laughs> the right. effects in the background and whatnot, the set, it's so bad yeah. Yeah, well. compared to what I thought. Like at the time when you're watching it on a bad set, you didn't notice these things. But in a little higher quality, you just see all the faults. Um, well, it's the bigger screen size, too. That doesn't well, help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch, yeah. People are watching these on 65 plus inch screens. I mean, when that movie came out, the, the yeah. screens were eight inches. Yeah. <laughs> well, and black and white. Yeah, it's amazing. The it Wizard of Oz original on Blu ray. Yeah. It's not impressive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what they do to it, do you know? They put what? it on Blu ray. Like, what did they do? Rescan the film. I don't know. That was the original film? Yeah. yeah. I assume so. The only, the only reason that show still looks good is because it was done well, yeah. probably with really good lenses. On well, film at the time, well, it doesn't compare to new stuff. Yeah, right. no, no, modern no, no, productions yeah. are way better. <laughs> no, they put you. care into them. As I recall, I think Wizard of Oz was the first Technicolor movie. 
Ah. So they shot each color on a separate film. RGB? Yeah, so it's actually really good. Yeah, three lenses to make one, yeah. one, one photo. You could see how things changed over time, though, because that was made knowing the limitations of the format. They knew, well, this doesn't matter because you won't see it. Um, and that happened to some extent in audio, you got to imagine. Sure. Oh, absolutely. varying degrees, yeah. right? They oh, knew, yeah. well, this doesn't really matter. Right. And the attention paid now is more considerable because it has to be. Yeah, because what they were playing back on in a time, yeah. you'd never hear the mistakes. Right. Yeah. And it wouldn't even come close. I mean, right in the mastering room themselves, when they're putting down, you know, figuring out the final mix, they wouldn't hear any of that stuff. Well, even like in the 60s, like you listen to like 60s recordings and there's like one mic in a room and you just hear like echoes and people talking in the background. <laughs> you wouldn't hear that in like news stuff. They, yeah. You know, so. But there are some stellar old recordings. Yeah. They were done on probably a few microphones and they, they just paid attention to the chain and God knows what they were listening to it on to get yeah. to that, you know. I don't know if they just had live. They were just, they had some sort of headphone device or something where they were actually listening to what was going through the chain. I don't know how they monitored that, you know. I mean, I'm sure people that were back in the day know this, but but some of the recordings are just stellar and to even today by today's Some standards, are excellent. You know, just crazy yeah. how good they did. They, they just paid attention. They must have paid attention to detail, figuring Someone will notice sooner or later. <laughs> you know? had the best equipment you can get at the time. Yeah. And yeah. they went a little beyond. Yeah. They figured, well, if it makes it better, but I can't tell, let's do it anyways. And maybe they heard it. Maybe whatever. Maybe, maybe they had enough experience with what they were listening to it through where they could hear the perceived difference. As minute as it may have been, just like people today hear difference yeah. with everything in, in audio, the cables and the breaking of the cables. And you think about it, I guess you could get to that level with any speaker, I suppose, yeah, if, you, familiar, if you really know if it. If you know your gear, yeah. Yeah, if you really know it. And all it takes is they were after that 1%, which today amounts to 10 or 20%, uh, if you think about it, yeah. relative to somebody who could give a shit about that, you know, and just kind of just threw some mics in the room and called it a recording. So, yeah, there's like everything in life, there's various levels of uh, care <laughs> given to this. But, yeah, in the end, you've got clarity to the source. Mm. You've got detail, which, which helps you hear the clarity to the source. And then you have levels, various levels of brightness in whatever degrees you want to add or subtract or take away from. And all that has to be averaged in respect to the original recording. What a job. Pretty much. It's a big job. It's hard. Well, nobody really knows. Hmm? No, no. But you could come pretty close. Yeah. It's come pretty close. And you know what? It's going to have to be good enough. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's as good as it gets. <laughs> so on that note, everybody, thank you very much for watching. Remember, we got pillows and mugs at abyssstore.com. And uh, don't forget that all these videos we do are in podcast form on just about every podcast format. Just, just... Go ask Siri or take a look at Apple or wherever there's a podcast on this available. So if you're driving and you get bored, have a listen to us. Take care. <laughs>